you bow your heads and pray with me? Lord, night has fallen, and we wait here with you. We wait to hear your words spoken to us, and so, Lord, give us ears to hear it, hearts to receive it, eyes to behold it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Growing up, I was a bit of a movie buff. My mother will tell you that. And one of my favorite movies of all time is a little cinema gem by the name of Ratatouille. Ratatouille is an animated Disney movie that came out when I was in high school. And it tells the story of a rat named Remy who dreams of becoming a famous chef in Paris. Now, I'll try not to spoil the movie, but I will say that one of my favorite scenes comes at the end. One of the villains of Ratatouille is a food critic by the name of Anton Ego, and his sole purpose throughout the whole movie is to critique everything. He has a negative perspective on all food. He doesn't believe what, Re what Remy believes, which is that anyone can cook. He's very skinny because if he doesn't like the food that he's eating, he just spits it out. Now at the end of the movie, Anton goes into this restaurant that Remy has been secretly cooking at, and he's ready to tear this place apart. His meal arrives, and he takes one look at it. It's a meal that the movie is named after, Ratatouille. And to Anton, it's nothing more than a peasant dish. It's a, it's a meal that poor people and people without taste would eat. So he clicks his pen, ready to critique. And then he takes his fork, and he takes a small bit of the meal, and he takes a bite. As soon as he tastes the ratatouille, though, all of a sudden he's instantly transported to his childhood home, and there's an image of his mother waiting for him with this comfort food, ratatouille. And he feels this deep comfort and love seeing her. His past is made present in that moment. Now back in the present, Anton drops his pen and he happily eats the rest of the dish. He feels all that love and comfort of a home in that simple meal. And like all good food, a meal sparks a memory of goodness and love. And meals have a way of doing that. We all have dishes that are connected to memories and stories that we have. I'm sure there are many of you who have one dish that's on your Thanksgiving table that has some long story attached to some long past relative, but it has a long story attached to it that you always tell every time you gather together. Shared meals bring stories with them. They help us remember. Through eating and drinking, the stories and moments of the past are made present to us today. Now tonight, we will take part in one of those meals. Tonight is Maundy Thursday. We've been walking this Holy Week journey together as a church. We began with the joy and triumph of Palm Sunday this past Sunday, and now we find ourselves on the edge of a cliff of sorts. We're about to descend into the pain and the anguish of Good Friday, where we remember the death of Jesus on the cross. But tonight, tonight we find ourselves at a table with Jesus and his disciples, eating and drinking. So many events happened on this night. Jesus washed feet, as our vestry will do over in Canterbury Hall. He prayed in the garden, and he was betrayed by one of his closest followers. But tonight, I want to focus on that meal that he shares with his friends, and how that meal helps us to truly remember God's work you see, that meal that Jesus shared had a story attached to it long before they met in that upper room. It was Passover. It was a meal that helped the people of Israel remember the fact that God had saved them from bondage in Egypt. And now at the Last Supper, that saving act is given a new definition. The story is told once again, and God's people are told to remember once again. But they, what they are told to remember is Jesus Christ and his sacrifice 
for the sins of the world. And that's the same thing for us tonight. We're called to remember that story in this sacred meal shared among disciples. Tonight, we recall and we proclaim that God has come to save his people through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And through remembering that story in this meal, through remembering Jesus and his sacrifice, that same Jesus is made present to us tonight in bread and wine, in body and blood. So tonight, I want to look at three meals, Passover, the Last Supper, and the communion that we will enjoy together tonight, and how those meals proclaim God's saving work. The first meal that we heard about tonight is found in our Old Testament lesson. A reading from Exodus tells us about a very complex meal that the people of Israel are to eat every year. The circumstances surrounding this meal are very well known. At the beginning of the book of Exodus, we find the Jewish people enslaved in Egypt. They are in dire straits, but God is faithful to them. He remembers them and selects Moses to go and set his people free. So Moses goes to Pharaoh and argues for Israel's freedom. Pharaoh doesn't want the people to leave, though, so God sends plagues on Egypt. And after nine plagues, we reach this passage in Exodus. God tells Moses that the tenth plague will result in the death of every firstborn in the land of Egypt. God is going to execute justice, on the land of Egypt, and the only way to escape this plague is to eat a very specific meal and take the blood of a lamb and put it on their doorposts. If God sees this blood, he will pass over the house. That's where the phrase Passover comes from. And as we read through this passage, the details for this meal are complex. There are specific instructions for the kind of lamb that's used, the way that the lamb is cooked, and what you should be wearing when you eat the meal. The whole meal is meant to make the people think that they need to hurry. That's why they eat unleavened bread. It hasn't had time for the bread to rise. The Israelites are basically supposed to pack their bags and get ready to travel. And why is that? Because this is their last meal in Egypt. Through this final plague, Pharaoh will let the Israelites go, and it will be the beginning Of their journey to freedom. And this meal that the Israelites eat together, this Passover, this meal will be eaten as God delivers his people from slavery. The meal and God's saving act are intertwined. This is a meal with a story, a story of God's saving work. Now, as we read through all the complex instructions for how Passover is done, you might notice the phrase that it's at the end of the passage. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. For the people of Israel, Passover was, the first Passover was designed to not be the last Passover. This will be a meal that they will eat year after year. And as they do it, they will remember together what happened on that first Passover. Throughout the Old Testament, Israel is always being encouraged to remember. And they're encouraged especially to remember the ways that God has saved them. So they eat this meal of Passover and they tell the story. They tell the story over and over again so that they do not forget it. And as they eat Passover, God's saving act is proclaimed and the story is made present to them. It's almost like they're back at the first Passover, experiencing God's salvation once again. And so Israel treats Passover as a day of remembrance. They continue to celebrate this meal year after year. They continue to tell that story of God's saving work year after year. And one of those years, a Jewish rabbi named Jesus prepares to eat Passover with his closest followers. We hear about that meal in tonight's lesson from the Gospel of Luke. Jesus gathers his disciples for a final meal. The Gospel of Luke has been building to this. The book has been telling the story of Jesus' life. And now it's coming to the final moments before his passion, death, and resurrection. But before Jesus suffers, he sits down for one last time 
to remember God's saving work through the Passover meal. He tells his disciples that this will be the last time that he will eat Passover until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. But as Jesus takes the unleavened bread and the wine, he does something interesting. He takes the bread and says, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He takes the cup and says, this cup which is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. Jesus is taking the elements of a Passover meal and giving them new meaning. He is calling his disciples to remember God's saving act. But the act that he's talking about is not God's deliverance of the Israelites from the bondage of Egyptian slavery. He's talking about a saving act that's about to happen. God's deliverance of all people from the bondage of sin and death. In less than 24 hours, Jesus will be crucified on a cross for the sins of the world. His body will be given. His blood will be poured out. And through this act, through this sacrifice upon the cross and the resurrection three days later, God will save his people. And to remember this saving act, Jesus gives his disciples a meal to eat. He gives them a meal to tell a story. Here in the upper room, among fishermen, a tax collector, and the man that will betray him, Jesus shares a simple meal that proclaims that God has come to save his people once and for all. And that meal is the meal that we take part in tonight. The Last Supper is the beginning of what we now call the Sacrament of Holy Communion. It is a sacrament that has been celebrated from the earliest days in the church. It is a meal that we heard about in tonight's reading from 1 Corinthians. And in that reading, what familiar words do we hear? Do this in remembrance of me. And so tonight, as the people of God, we remember. We remember that bread and wine were given to disciples, that they might know Christ fully. Tonight, we allow the bread and wine to take us back to that Last Supper, take us back to that moment when Jesus looks at his disciples and tells them, this is my body, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Tonight, we remember together that God loved us enough to send his son to die for us, And tonight, we recall the mighty deeds of God with a simple meal of bread and wine. Now, much ink and blood has been spilled over the years trying to articulate what happens when we come together at this table. What happens to the elements? What happens to us? All that sort of stuff. And I'm not up here to discuss the finer points of sacramental theology tonight. But what I will tell you is that as we remember Jesus in this act of Holy Communion, as we remember the story of God's saving work, that story becomes present to us tonight. The story becomes present to us in the person of Jesus Christ. In these elements of bread and wine, Jesus becomes present to us in his body and blood through the work of the Holy Spirit. It is a mystery that I cannot explain, but through this meal, somehow, we encounter Jesus. We meet him. We meet the one who has sacrificed everything for us. And so as you come forward tonight, as you remember God's saving work, as you taste bread and wine tonight, allow yourself to be swept up in the miraculous and beautiful story of God's saving work. Allow that story to transform your life. And allow yourself to become part of that story. That's the beautiful thing about communion. And to be honest, that's the beautiful thing about the whole Christian life. Becoming a part of the story of God. You're a part of the same story that the first disciples were a part of. The same story that the Israelites were a part of. You're a part of the story of God. So tonight, we will come forward, and we'll take communion together. 
It's the last time that we're going to take communion before Easter. And as much as I would like to say that this will be a special communion, that there's something unique about Maundy Thursday that makes it some higher level of communion, um, that you will remember for the rest of your life, um, that will probably not be the case. I can hardly remember any of the Eucharists that I have been a part of. They all kind of blend together in my mind. But I sometimes wonder if that's a good thing. We don't remember the act of the communion. We remember the one we encounter in that communion. And each time we come to this table, we encounter him. We encounter him here. And as we continue on in our faith, as we continue on in that path of discipleship, We come to know him more and more. Each time you get down at this rail, you come to know him more and more. So as you come tonight, with on your knees, with arms outstretched, remember Jesus. Remember his sacrifice and saving work. And allow the story of his love to be made real to you once again. Amen.